Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with veteran jazz musician Carl Berger. He grew up in Germany and started to play piano at 10 and worked in his teens at clubs. He learned modern jazz from visiting American musicians like Don Ellis and Leo Wright. Not too bad. During the 60s, he started playing the vibraphone and received a doctorate degree in musicology and worked as a member of Don Cherry's band in Paris. That was huge. He would end up in New York City with the Ornette Coleman machine, creating the Creative Music Studio. He is a six-time winner of the Downbeat Critics Poll as a jazz soloist, and he is quite a professor up to this day. So get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. Carl, thanks for taking a minute out. I appreciate it. Sure. So talk to me a little bit about any projects that might be going on right now for you. Well, there's um, a film being made, like... um by a German filmmaker by the name of uh, Julian uh, Benedict, who also did a film on Blue Note, I think. He did also one on Chico Hamilton and a few other films. And that's like in the last uh, year or so, is sort of a project that's been going on, both in Europe and here. So they came to Orlando where we had a orchestra concert with um, uh, improvised orchestra concert uh, two years ago and that's how it started and then they came to a few of the creative music studio workshop sessions and filmed that and then they collected a lot of archival stuff and uh, it's uh, like a film which will open at the Woodstock Film Festival in October 10th started as a project for German television, and uh, so they have a television version of it, and the international version a little longer, like about 80 minutes or so, and that will open in Woodstock. Talk to me about your childhood in Germany. How did you get involved with the piano, and how did jazz become something on your radar? (laughs) I grew up in Heidelberg, Germany, and uh, Heidelberg was the headquarters of the American forces, as you might know, and in about a 100-mile radius around there, there were a bunch of Army and Air Force um, bases which had um, uh, bands, uh, Air Force, uh, bands. In, in these bands, uh, quite a few American jazz players were playing, and they would all come to a place called the CAV 54, C-A-V-A 54 in Heidelberg, which was one of the first jazz clubs uh, around in at that time. Uh, and I was just about um, coming from out of school, and I was, I was actually a classical piano uh, student at the conservatory, but I started playing then down in this club with all these American guys. So it was like having jam sessions in New York, or <laughs> and it was like every day. And then after a while, my piano teacher at the conservatory started asking me about jazz, and, and I said, well, you know, like uh, uh, I'm paying you to teach me, and uh, so you should come to the club. And he said, well, I can't really afford to come to the club being a professor at the, <laughs> at the conservatory. So I said, well, then in that case, I can't afford to come here anymore, and so I became a jazz player. <laughs> Some of those early musicians was like Don Ellis and Leo Wright. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. Don Ellis, Leo Wright, Lex Humphreys, let me see, Cedar Walton, a uh, whole bunch of people. Uh, I, that's where I met Carlos Ward, who I later played with a lot. He was like 18, and he was in the army at the time. Seeing those guys at such a young age had to make a huge impression on you. What do you remember about them being on stage in their presence that really made an impression on you? <laughs> well, the, just the way the music came over, so powerful, you know. I, I, I didn't know that. I, I hadn't known that experience from European players at all. Uh, it's just like the, you know, the power of expression, like the... the the need to play, to express yourself is, is, is very strong. Let me ask you this more specifically. There's things okay. that you learn on stage and in the real world, and there's things that you learn in the classroom. 
What right. in the classroom did you learn that, that really kind of made you grow as a musician? The musicology, uh, I was actually studying more philosophy than, than musicology. I was sort of interested in philosophical questions. At the same time, I was interested in music. So uh, basically, I got involved with, um, with the work of uh, uh, Theodore Adorno and those guys, uh, the ideology critic. They actually didn't even like jazz, you know. They, but they didn't understand what it what it was. So, <laughs> so it was sort of a, a double line. I was actually playing, you know, studying at the time in, at the university was very different from what it is now. I didn't have to take any exams other than the doctor's exam. I could study not even seeing the university from the inside if I wanted to. The one thing I did want to ask you, too, is, is your time at Don Cherry, um, yeah. more specifically okay. in Paris. What did you learn from a guy like him? Well, <laughs> he was a, a game changer, you know, like... Uh, he was the first one to let me know a whole bunch of principles that we have founded the uh, Creative Music Studio on. One of them being that um, there's a common common ground to all the music in the world that you can actually work from. So that styles are not really like different languages, but they're just different dialects of the same language which is common to everyone on this planet. And that gave us the uh, incentive to start the Creative Music Studio. So when you came to New York City to record your debut album with the right. Symphony for Improvisers, what, how big was that for you? What kind of uh, artistic momentum did you get from that? Oh, yeah. I mean, that was a very big one. We basically came into New York from the top rather than having to come in and build from the bottom. So it was, like, great. It was fantastic. And then your work with Ornette Coleman for the Creative Music Studio in Woodstock, that had to be another huge part of your early life. Talk to me about yeah. how that was all set up. Through Dawn, we met Ornette. Ornette already had come to Paris where we played in, the, in this club, the Chaki Pêche. And when we came to New York... Uh, Ingrid uh, and myself, we would like go and see Ingrid Serzo, my wife, and and uh, singer, uh, and myself, and my myself, we would like go over to Ornette pretty much every week. I just like had learned from Don Cherry about this whole world of homiletics, and it was just like the most interesting way to deal with music because it was sort of beyond style and it was just like some exhilarating kind of situation for me and for Ingrid and so we spent a lot of time with on at, um, at his place on Prince Street and um, uh, which is out of those discussions uh, Creative Music Studio developed that whole idea. You've done a lot of arrangements for di different musicians, you know, from Jeff Buckley's Gray to right. the Cardigans and all these. What kind of the unifier with all of these pieces that you've done? Is, I mean, is it, is, is it that music is music is music, or what kind of flavors do each of these have for you? Well, there, you, there you go. You just said it. Music is music. There's good music or there's bad music, you know, and it can be in any style. So these guys are all tremendous musicians in their styles, and it was very easy to work with them because they weren't thinking in terms of references or uh, trying to copy somebody else's music or anything like that. Like when, as soon as like uh, I, I had calls from people like Britney Spears or others where I turned them down because uh, they wanted they, they wanted to have. Uh, uh, me follow very specific references of what the music should be and uh, the other guys were like totally open I could write whatever I heard and that's that's what music is all about to me so that there's a perfect example of that there is no such thing as uh, a stylistic border for good music speaking of stylistic borders you know, you've worked with, with a lot of people in your career, you know, like Lee right. Koenig, 
And what I want to know is, you know, Lee was kind of come from that bebop leanings and more traditional, and then you got someone like Don Cherry or Ronette Coleman. What was it about them that that you liked working with? I mean, did 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 they make you kind of think about music and grow in very specific ways? Well, you know, what they taught me is to follow what I like and what I hear, you know, rather than to follow any rules that somebody else is making for you. You know, so uh, when I play with Lee and he's he's playing in a certain harmonic framework, uh, I just love to uh, put my diamonds uh, sent uh, to that rather than uh, trying to convince Lee or anybody else to play something else. I mean, <laughs> see what I'm saying? Yeah. He, he is at home where he is, and uh, then I can deal with him in whatever f- way that feels comfortable for me, like that I feel like good about, you know. So it's all about relying on what you personally like, you know. And Lee is a tremendous player, uh, and actually, Lee, I, I reminded Lee more than once that he was one of the first with Lenny Tristano to play for him, you know. <laughs> so mm-hmm. he, he was much, much more capable of doing stuff than he then later actually let himself do. He became more conservative as he went on. But he just followed what he liked, and that's what I really think everybody should do. So I'm going to segue out of musicians and kind of get into geography. You've been all over the world, you know. You've been to Tokyo, London, Paris, Rome, and spots right. in between. What is what is it like to present your music to different cultures around the world? It's fun, you know, like, of course. Uh, but uh, people just hear different things, you know, like you're playing the same thing for, in a different cultural environment. People will hear something else, like the... Uh, and again... I found that uh, uh, the responses everywhere in the world are actually for live music when we play. It's always very, very, very good. That tells me that there's a fun- fundamental human nature also that goes for the kind of musical emotions that are universal. They are not. They are not like uh, depending on certain cultural environment. You know, over your career, you've been recognized with a lot of awards, from Downbeat, Composition Awards. So I want to ask you this. I don't want to know what your favorite award is, but what award did you receive that really surprised you, that kind of caught you off guard? Oh, actually, I'm still waiting for that one. (laughs) I like that. How do you feel about your career so far? You've done so much. You've been so prolific. Are you happy? Well, you know, like um, we were blessed with the ability to do what we wanted to do, but it's been very hard because uh, the times have changed. The music business and the whole uh, the whole music environment has changed like three times since since I started out in in fundamental ways, like the way music music is now being consumed and also being uh, uh, handled uh, as a business has is like a hundred percent different from even 20 30 years ago as you might know yeah and uh, the strange thing is that for musicians that picture is not pretty most kids now with all these machines and gadgets uh, expect music to be free they don't want to pay for music. They don't see why they should pay for anything. But at the same time, the musicians are uh, are expected to produce music. Now, but if you don't pay them, how how does that happen? The producers, interestingly, found out that musicians want to play so bad that they're producing music anyway, even if they're not getting paid for it. <laughs> Yeah. So we have a really strange situation where there is like a, a hundred to two hundred CDs per day coming out of all kinds of music, but most of it is produced at the expense of the musicians, and very few musicians are actually making money with music. Like yeah. my performance rights organization used to pay me, I used to get a check of, let's say, uh, I don't know, between three and $5,000 for compositions that were played around the world. 
which is not much, you know, but uh, this improvised music is kind of limited of how you can collect money that way. But that same company now pays me something like $200 a year, mm. or something like that. It's like, it's unbelievable. Like, you know, so the, the economic conditions for making music have completely changed, you know. Uh, it's kind of hard to deal with that, uh, frankly, for a lot of people. And uh, uh, but at the same time, the Creative Music Studio has had a, re a rebirth uh, about seven, eight years ago, with some new administrators coming in and and also more interest of the next generation. And now Billy Martin, the um, drummer from Medeski Martin and Wood, that you might know. He is now the president. He took over from me last year. It's really thriving. If you go to creativemusic.org, that site, you will see what we're doing now. And you're going to also see about the movie and all these things. Are up. There's lots of videos there, and, and you see how there's a worldwide response. Billy just came back from Japan and started uh, stuff there and we're doing more in New York we're doing more in different parts of the world it's like it's, a, it's amazing that the creative music city itself has a strong interest from the next generation let me ask you as a professor what do you like to teach your kids what do you want them to take away from your teaching well the main thing is I like for people to believe in their music you know like everybody is unique and everybody has a lot to say in a very unique way. And most people with the kind of systems that are happening right now are not even getting to that point where they can actually appreciate that. Um, you know, most people are satisfied with being able to uh, just like perform in a certain mode and be able to sound almost like this or the other guy. But there is much more within everybody, so I'm trying to encourage people to trust and uh, build confidence in their own ability, you know, to play, perform, compose, and uh, uh, express their own stuff, you know. At the yeah. same time, yeah, that's sort of the, the main thing, I think, and that's sort of the main thing that we do at the, the Creative Music Studio. So I'm curious, in your life, of watching live performances. What shows, Jazz, specifically have you seen that has really moved you and made a deep impression? I don't really see too many shows. And, and I never quite understood, actually, the this whole idea of concerts where you cramp like 2,000 people into one room to listen to five guys play. Uh, it's When I go to a concert, I usually see the last part of it and that's usually like more than enough information for me for the next three months <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> we just played at a festival in Stuttgart Germany and uh, there were like five days of concerts there and frankly I didn't see even one of them because yeah. we were yeah. focused on getting our show together and then do that you know Sure. Which, was sure. tre which was tremendous. It was a great experience, but I didn't get to hear anybody else, frankly. You know? yeah. So let me ask you this. When the world of jazz and music peels back the layers of history and they come across your name, I know you're far from done, but when you look at your life up to this point, how do you want the world of jazz to remember you and what you did for it? <laughs> I don't know. That's... <laughs> I, I mean that's not of interest to me. I mean, you know, I don't I don't know whether people remember me or not. That's really outside of the realm of how I'm thinking. I don't think about stuff like that. I like it, Carl. Thank you for taking some time out for me at Neon Jazz today. I appreciate it. All right. Well, thank and you. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the globe, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Carl for his time and his music. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit NeonJazz at YouTube.com, and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, 
go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.